The drunk on the street, the rich in their palaces, the poor and unlearned, and men of degree, they all have a soul in need of salvation, and they all have to come by Calvary. Glad God saves old sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed how He sets them free. But the greatest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that He would save an old sinner like me. I was so wrong, I needed forgiveness, and I was so bad, I had to be redeemed. I wasn't a thief, but I lived in sin's prison, and I was as lost as a sinner could be. Glad God saves old sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed how He sets them free. But the greatest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that He would save an old sinner like me. Glad God saves all sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed how He sets them free. But the greatest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that He would save an old sinner like me. I'm glad that he saved an old sinner like me. How many of you glad he still saves old sinners? You ought to be glad. Some may be act like, well, that's all right. My goodness, you're not going to hell. Thank God. Sing the last verse again. I was so wrong, I needed forgiveness, and I was so bad, I had to be redeemed. I wasn't a thief, but I lived in sin's prison, and I was as lost as a sinner could be. I am so glad God saves old sinners. I'm thrilled and amazed how He sets them free. But the greatest surprise in redeeming old sinners is that He would save an old sinner like me. I'm glad that he saved an old sinner like me. Amen. Boy, that's good. All of them's good. We'll be in the book of Acts this morning, chapter number 7. Matter of fact, I think we was there last Sunday. Same story, same man. Different message. Acts chapter 7. Last Sunday, I preached on a man named Stephen or some things about him. I've changed my title now because I've done re-preached it. I, I feel like the Lord gave me that for last Sunday, but he also gave it to me for that men's conference I preached at. Changed some things on it and preached it over there. But in Acts chapter 7, if you know about Stephen, he's 
one of the first seven deacons in the Bible. Stephen was a great man of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells you about Stephen, and when it describes the kind of man Stephen was, he was a man of honest report and full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. He was a man, the Scripture says, was full of faith and power. He did great wonders among the people. He was a man that knew the Bible. As a matter of fact, when he was challenged by the libertines, the liberals, amen, <laughs> they're still challenging people with the Bible today. And when he was challenged about those things, the Bible says that he preached a message to these people. And it went 51 verses. I mean, Acts chapter 7, about verse 2, all the way to chapter 7, verse uh, 53, or whatever it is, Stephen's preaching to them. And he gives a great big history of the Old Testament. And then he brings it in, all the history of the Old Testament, he brings it in, and he preaches on Christ, if you remember that story. And anyway, as he gets through preaching, boy, the people get mad at him. Because they murdered Christ, and they're still alive. I mean, this is the same year that Christ died. This is 33 A.D., the same year he died, and it's just after that. And the church is thriving. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, all the way down in verse number 54, it says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. That's called conviction. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. You realize the word gnash means to grind with the teeth? I mean, these people are so mad at Stephen that they've got him, and they're about to drag him out of the city and kill him. And they're biting him and everything else. I mean, I'm talking about it's a mob. That's what happens when a mob starts ruling. You don't have law and order. Bad things start happening. That's what's going on here. And they're fine as long as you go by their agenda. But if you start preaching Jesus and Jesus saves and only Jesus and talk about how people ought to be in church and serving God, then the mob gets going. And they don't like that. It's okay to go to football games and basketball games and volleyball games and baseball games, but it's not okay to assemble in church, you know. No, you can't do that. It's spread there, but it doesn't spread in gymnasiums and it doesn't spread in schoolhouses. It doesn't spread in... You name it. But in church, no, you can't have that, you know. That's a, that's a no-no. We know better than that. But anyway, here they are, and they're cut to the heart. They're under conviction. And so instead of turning to God, they turn against him. And then it says in verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, that's Stephen, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And so Stephen's the first man that died for his faith after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Not only did he die for his faith, he was a martyr. He was killed in cold blood murder. And I'm going to tell you, these were the dignitary people. These were the politicians. You say, well, they wouldn't do that. Oh, they would be glad to do it if they could do it. And they want to do it. They'd like to get rid of you, and they'd like to get rid of me, just like they did Stephen. And here they got rid of him, and it's bad, man. I'm talking about it's really bad. But when I read about this, I got thinking about it, and I preached on this passage last Sunday. I preached on it Friday night. And I thought about the Lord, and the Bible says in verse 55, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. And then it says, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. It said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, I've read in the Bible, uh, all through the Bible, as a matter of fact, uh, I was teaching in the Bible Institute here a while back, and, and I gave a bunch of references about where the Lord sat down on the right hand of God, and the Bible talks about that over and over again. And there's no doubt that He did just that. He sat down on the right hand of the Father, is what the Scripture says. And, and it's amazing what He did. And, I mean, He went and He did the work of, uh, at the cross, and He finished that work by dying on the cross. They buried him. He rose again. He ascended up on high. And the scripture says he took a seat. He's seated on the right hand of the Father. And that's, that's amazing. That's where he is. People say, I wonder where the Lord is right now. He's seated on the right hand of the Father according to the Bible. 
I mean, he's not in a pancake that was misshaped. You know, I see the Lord in that. He's not in some cloud. You say, well, I can see Jesus there. No, he's seated on the right hand of the Father. That's where he's at. He's not in some whatever you're trying to make it out to be, you know. And by the way, every time somebody says he's in a cloud and they have these pictures, they don't even know what he looked like to begin with. That's what somebody drew. That's a drawing. And it's, it's not even a, the same description that you read about in the Bible that doesn't even look what the description says. So it gets kind of humorous when people do s s things like that. But I thought about that. You might wonder, why in the world was, what's he doing up there seated on the right hand of the Father? What could he be doing? And I think there's several things that he's doing. As a matter of fact, I believe him being seated on the right hand of the Father shows that there's an alliance with the Father. What the Father is saying is when he received the Son back up into glory and sat him down on his right hand over here on the right side, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. He's seated right there. What he's saying is I'm in alliance with my Son. Me and my Son are one now. And we're in alliance together. And what he's basically told him was that's a job well done. I mean, he's brought him back in all the way in. And there they are together. And if you remember uh, more than one occasion, God the Father spoke down on earth like at the baptism of Christ. And he said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He said at the Mount of Transfiguration when Christ was transfigured in all of his glory. And Peter and them got to talking. He said, listen, be quiet. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, they said. He's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And there's no doubt that he's well pleased with him. He has a spot next to the Father like nobody else has. He's different than anybody else. It shows unity. It shows that they're in alliance in one accord, that they're one in the Godhead is what it's showing. But it's more than that. It also shows strength. Him seating on the right hand of God there, the Father, shows strength. The right hand in the Bible, you read through the Bible and all the way even back in Genesis and different places, you can read about that right hand. And the right hand seemed like the strength of something. And every time you read about that, there's strength involved. And what that is saying is him sitting on the right hand of the Father is showing that he has strength just like the Father has and that God is in control of everything. He's got the power of everything right there in his hand. And he's more powerful than anything or anything that can come against him. And so it shows great strength and God is in control. You may look around in this world and say, this world's gone crazy and you would be right. You've got a good analysis. The world has gone crazy and they're getting crazier by the moment. It's amazing. It's amazing that people would even, uh, you would even have to think about voting on some of the things people are voting on. You're like, what? what? That wasn't that way when I was a kid. Nobody would have voted for that. But now we're living in a generation where people have turned their back on God and they've moved away from the Lord and they think, my goodness, this world's in trouble and it might be in trouble, but I want you to know that God is still in control. The Lord is seated on the right hand of the Father on His right hand, the strength of Him. And there's great control there. But there's more than that. You say there is. Oh yeah. As a matter of fact, Him seated on the right hand of the Father, He's there because He's making intercession on behalf of the believer. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 7, verse 25, it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Aren't you glad we've got somebody that's praying on our behalf? You know, a lot of times we call people, Elizabeth's dad's in really bad shape, and Sister Joan's not in good shape, and there's others that's been in bad shape, and we've got folks with cancer, and we've got problems of physical problems in our church. Spiritually, we're doing pretty well. But physically, we've got a lot of people that's got problems and, and we're praying for them and they're on our prayer list and we're concerned about them. We want to see things get better. And sometimes the doctors give us bad news and you know, you think of little Olivia and some of these that's had what they've had. And anyway, it's a terrible conditions, but God's done some things. And sometimes you can't do anything about it. And, and I, I know I called this morning some of my friends and I called uh, Brother Jim Chandler and asked them to be praying. And I called Brother Stalker because one thing I found out about Brother Stalker, if you ask him to pray about something, he does it right then. It's not, it's not playing around. He really does it. And I knew he would pray and that's why I asked him to. We're not just calling people to pray just so, well, okay, yeah, we'll pray for you. Listen, we don't need that. What we need is people praying is what we need. 
And I, and I knew he'd pray. I called Brother Tony Hudson, and he said, I'm praying right now, and he wanted my wife's number. He's wanting to call and pray for her. Our church will be praying. Just some of my friends, you know, and she sent out things. And we've got others in the church that have needs, and, and, and several of them that have needs. But what we're saying this morning is, We've got somebody greater than anybody down here on earth praying on our behalf. And I'm telling you, somebody that can get a hold of the Father, somebody that can still get their prayers answered, he's seated on his right hand, and his name's Jesus, and he's forever making intercession for us, the Bible says. See, it's a wonderful thing that Jesus sat down where he sat. What a blessing that is. We should be so thankful. When you don't know where to turn, turn to Jesus. When you don't know what to do, talk to Jesus. When you don't know who to call, call Jesus. Turn to Him and ask Him for His help. He can help you when nobody else can. You say, why? Because He sat down. He finished the work and He was, and he was buried and He rose again and He ascended up on high and He sat down right beside the Father. But that's not what I want to preach on. I don't even really have much of a message. I just wrote down a few notes because when I was preaching Friday night, I got a sermon. And I said, I hope I can remember some of this. But it says in verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. That's the only time you see that. And I read over and over and over again where it says he sat down on the right hand of God and where he's seated on the right hand of God. But for a few minutes this morning, I'd like to just preach when God stood up. One time he stood up in the Bible. He wasn't seated right there. And it's different. I can show you over and over where he sat down, but I want to talk about where he stood up. That's where I want to talk about to this morning. One time he stood up. That must mean something. And so when God stood up, is my message. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you do for us. We need your help this morning. Lord, I've got some talking and laughing and giggling, and some of them are grown. And Father, I pray you'd get them. Get a hold of them right now. And Lord, I just pray that we could meet with you today. Lord, we need your help, and we need your touch. And Lord, I pray we could tune in to the message. And I pray this morning that you might help me and give me the words to say. And Father, there might be somebody that needs exactly what's being preached right now. Father, we've got some that are lazy, they're not here. Some of them can't get around in time. They just barely, what it, Lord, I pray we could get serious about you. I pray we'd get in church and do what's right. If there's ever a time we needed you, we need you right now. Our country's going to hell. We're in a mess in America. Lord, people are just halfway doing it. No wonder we're in trouble. Oh, Father, I pray for God's people to get right with you. I pray for your help this morning. May we get in and do what we need to do. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful example where it says that you stood up. And Lord, this morning, I pray that you might help me preach. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You say, what about when God stood up? Well, there are several things we could say about that. Take your Bible and go to Mark chapter 10. I'm not going to be turning a bunch of places. This might be the only place I turn. And I might come back to Acts 7 one time. But in Mark chapter number, if you want to mark that. But in Mark chapter number 10, there's a great story over there. In Mark chapter number 10, Mark chapter number 10, there's a, a blind man over there. As a matter of fact, there ends up being two of them, but this Mark only talks about one of them because it has a significant thing about this one. But in Mark chapter number 10, and verse 46, it says, And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still, and Jesus stood still, and commanded him to be called, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. And he casted away his garment, rose, and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. A blind man is by the gate begging. And the Lord comes by and he cries out to him. The Bible says his name's Bartimaeus. Brother Wayne was telling me, that's just wrong. He's telling me this morning about two blind men that got in a fight. And he said they were fighting each other. He said, you should have seen their face when a guy yelled out, 
I'm voting for the guy with the knife. Amen. <laughs> it's like, I'm, what? <laughs> Too blunt. I didn't know which one had the knife because neither one of them had one. But anyway, but, uh, <laughs> but here, what we see in this passage is we see the Lord stood up, but this place he stood still. You say, what did he stand still for? He's standing up and they've got him, they've got his attention. You say, when? When he's called by a sinner. When he's called by a sinner. I still believe that he'll stand up for a sinner to be saved. Let me tell you, the Lord wants you to be saved. He wants you to go to heaven. If you die and go to hell, it's your own fault because the Lord will stand up for a sinner. I believe that if you prayed to him and you called on him and asked God to help you, I believe he would stop what he's doing and stand still for a sinner and stand in his place. Thank God there was a time that the Lord stood up on the day that blind Bartimaeus needed him the most. He was, you say, oh, he was blind. He was in bad shape. Sure, he was blind in bad shape. But that was not even the most of his problems. I mean, he had bigger problems than that. His biggest problem was he was a sinner and he was undone and he was on his way to hell and he needed to be born again. That was his problem and blind Bartimaeus cried out to the right man and when he he wasn't a Democrat somebody say amen and he wasn't a Republican somebody say hallelujah he cried out to the King of Kings the Lord Jesus Christ and when he did he stood still and he received even the people said don't bother him and he cried out the more he, they said don't bother him let me just say if you're a lost person you're no bother to him he'd love to have you the Lord will stand still for you People are always thinking, well, I'm not worthy to be saved. That's probably what Bartimaeus thought. He couldn't work. He couldn't support a family. He was blind. Back then, they didn't have welfare like they've got now. And there's people that needed it, like a blind man. Not like a man that's too lazy to work. Somebody say amen. A blind man. He needed it. They didn't have canes and seeing eye dogs and all that kind of stuff. He needed help. And he was asking for help. And people gave handouts because the man literally couldn't work. That's different. And boy, he's trying to help the man. But when Jesus came by, he got more help than he'd ever had before. I bet he'd already heard about him. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's one of the greatest prayers in the Bible. You won't hardly find a better prayer. Jesus, thou son of David, he said, have mercy on me. I want you to know I'm thankful that he's a merciful God. I'm thankful that he'll have mercy on a sinner. I'm thankful that he's still saving old sinners. You know what the problem is? Most people don't think they're sinners anymore. Oh, he's a blind man. He, he's probably did something wrong while he's born blind. That's, no, you know better than that. People, that. Anything can happen to anybody. God's not a respecter of persons. It's not because he did something wrong. But there he is. People say, well, he's, he was no good. He came from that poor family. Well, those, some of those, those were the best families. He came from that family. That, they were white trash over there. Well, that's okay. Thank God for some of those families. God's used them in great ways. He's probably from the wrong side of the tracks. Well, that's okay, too. God loves everybody. And he looked on blind Bartimaeus. When everybody else said, leave him alone, he stopped and he stood still, the Bible says. He was standing there. You know what blind Bartimaeus saw? The first thing blind Bartimaeus saw when the Lord healed him, he saw Jesus standing. He stood there. The same thing Stephen saw. That's what Bartimaeus saw. He might not have seen him in heaven, but he saw him on earth. And he was standing still, the Bible says. Aren't you glad he stands still for sinners? I'm so glad the Lord will do that. I'm so glad he'll save our soul. Let me say something else. I got five of these. You say, my goodness, it's 1145. No, I just saw that with Phil. Uh, let me say this. He'll stand still when one mistreats his servants, I believe. I believe that. Did you see what was going on with Stephen? I mean, it's not just that Stephen was about to die. In the passage, when he looked up into heaven, they hadn't even... They hadn't even stoned him yet. When they cast him out before that and all that, he looked up into heaven and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Standing. You say, what's going on? They had been gnashing on him with their teeth. They were mad at him. I mean, they were shaking their fist at him. They had a peaceful riot. I mean, they were those Molotov uh, uh, bombs, whatever they call it, you know, cocktails they got. Where do you get those things? I don't know. And if you got one, you deserve to be in jail. Hey, man. <laughs> Burning cities down, trying to influence voters. You know, don't come. I mean, here they are, and a Christian comes up, and he's preaching the truth. They get and they start biting him. I mean, they're, talk, they're, they're acting like animals, what they're acting like. Like animals. I mean, that's how the world is now. The world has mistreated Christians for so long that people think that's okay. 
And we're living in a time where it's totally turned where people are mistreating Christians. And not only that, even the people that claim to be Christians have turned and they're following the world, like the Pope. He's not a Christian, he's a Catholic. You say, what's he say? He says, well, it's okay to have same-sex civil unions. No, it's an abomination to God. That's what somebody ought to be preaching. The Pope is a dope. He's wrong and he has no hope. I'm telling you, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that a man ought to have his own wife, his woman, and a woman ought to have her own husband. The Bible says God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what the Pope said. The Bible, the King James Bible trumps, I like that, trumps the Pope. Somebody say amen. It trumps the Pope. It doesn't matter what he thinks about it. We've got the Bible, the Word of God. Thank God for it too. But one of these days, he'll stand up when people mistreat his servants. It looks like they can do anything and get away with anything. Out in California, they're persecuting churches. And no longer can they meet in a building like we're meeting. They say, you can't do that. You're spreading the virus. But they can go to every hardware store, every Walmart. And they can pack those places in. I remember for a while at Walmart, they'd have a number there. And they said, we can only let so many people in there. And I always said, how many do you have? And they said, 100. I thought, you don't have 100. What's the odds of having 100? I said, well, how many workers you got in there? They go, well, we don't have that on there. I go, huh. Then you don't know how many is in there, do you? <laughs> Ain't that ridiculous? We're, okay, if, as long as we don't have too many in there, you can't catch the virus. Who says? Where'd that come from? They don't know anything about this stuff. They're just making it up as they go. And then they make you bunch up in a big line, and everybody gets single file in a big line and walk in, I mean, back to back, and you're thinking, wasn't it better before you put the barricades out there and you could just come in and out? Wasn't that easier? Don't t and then everybody touches the same machines. They're saying, it's all a big joke is what it is. The virus is real and it's a terrible thing, but the way that they're working on it is silliness. It doesn't make sense. They play volleyball. We're playing volleyball. They get on the speaker. Fans, do not touch a ball. Whatever you do, do not touch one of the balls. If it comes in the stands, one of the players will retrieve it. The ball comes in the stands, and it about hits a lady in the face, and she puts the hand up. We said not to touch the balls. I was thinking, she's about to get her face smashed in. That's a reaction. I mean, get over it. You know? <laughs> she did the right thing. She's about to get hit in the face. What do you do? You block it. Why don't you stand over in front of her where she don't have to do that or get off the microphone, you know? And anyway, and so now she's touched it. They throw the ball to the referee. He hands it to this girl who hands him another ball, and she wipes off the previous ball. But she hands him the other ball, and he throws it back out. He just touched both balls. But they wiped that one off so you can't get it. I'm thinking, my mind's working right there. I'm thinking, that doesn't make sense. He can't touch this contaminated ball and then the non-contaminated without washing his hands and throwing it. Why are they even doing what they're doing? Because it's silliness. It doesn't make any sense. That's how it comes. I'm not downplaying the virus. It's terrible. It's real. I'm not saying it. I'm just saying the way that they're trying to stop the spread of it makes absolutely no sense. And by the way, if you can go to Walmart and you can go eat in a restaurant, you need to be in church. Quit playing games. Get right with God. And get in church. If you don't do that, then that's different. Somebody ought to be, amen, you ought to be running laps around the building. Right. Run your laps out there too where they can see you, amen. That would be a good place to do it. But I think the Lord's going to get tired of people mistreating his people. And they've brought it on the church, they're against the church. I think we ought to be careful about this virus. It's bad. It really is bad. And we need to be careful. And we need to, we're not shaking hands, we're doing stuff on purpose. I'm just saying the, the things that they're doing don't make sense. I mean, you can't, you can't say, well, you can't do this, but you can do this. You know, you can't do, you're like, hold on, it does, why can you do it this time, but not this time? Either all or none, you know. You've got to be careful. But I think the Lord's going to get tired of people mistreating us. He stood up over there. I'll tell you something else. I believe that he stood up when he needed to fight the devil, fight Satan. Did you ever read about the temptation of Christ? I'd say he stood pretty good, wouldn't you? I'd say he did all right. I mean, the temptation of Christ, the devil threw everything at him that he had in his arsenal. The fiery darts, you know, I mean, he was shooting everything at him. And the Lord stood in his place and he stood up against the devil and he fought against him and he stopped him. I mean, when God stands up, big things start happening. I'm glad that he stood up. 
I'm thankful for it. He didn't just stand up there. He stood up when he came at him at the cross too. Because Isaiah chapter number 50, it tells us over there, when Jesus was dying on the cross, he said, Who is my adversary? Let him come to me. And it's the passage is about the cross. The name Satan means adversary. Who's my adversary? Come on. I always think of that in that movie, the first Rocky movie. You ever watch that one? It's the best one. I mean, the guy plays a real dumb character, but he wrote all the movie. You know, he's not dumb like you think. But everybody thinks he's real dumb because he plays a dumb character, but it's not always that way. Well, that first one was a masterpiece. They could probably got rid of some language, you know, but it's a masterpiece. The, the, and at the end of that thing, he's fighting Apollo Creed, and he's just a bum, and he shouldn't even be, And he said, I just want to go the distance with him. He said, nobody's ever gone the distance. He's the great champion. And in the 14th round, his eyes are almost closed shut. I mean, he's taking a beating like there's never been before. And they knock him down, and Apollo Creed, he's taking a little beating too. He wasn't expecting one. Puts his hands in the air and turning around. And his managers are saying, stay down, stay down. They know he's hurt. And Rocky grabs those ropes and starts climbing up. Man, that makes you motivated. I like that. And that music starts. About that time, Paula Craig turns around and he looks like that. Rocky goes, come on. He thought, you got to be kidding. That's what he said, come on. He wasn't finished. He said, I'm not quitting. You know, that's how the Lord was with the devil. And the Lord said, come on. And it looked like he was defeated. It looked like they tortured him. They beat him with a cat of nine tails. He probably said, whip him harder. They slapped him in the face. They plucked his beard. They put a crown of thorns on his head. He probably said, do it more. Put him in deeper. Pluck more of them. Slap him again. Punch him one more time. Keep on keeping on. And the Lord said, come on. Come on, is that all you got? You say, that's not real. It says so in Isaiah 50. He said, where is my adversary? Tell him to come to me. He said, come on, is what he said. When he died on the cross, he defeated every power and principality of the air. He defeated the devil himself. That's what Jesus did for me and you. We can't defeat the devil. But thank God somebody did it on our behalf. Aren't you glad this morning? He stood up when nobody else could. And let me just say, they put him down in a borrowed grave and they put him in there for three days and three nights and they said, make it sure. And they sealed the stone and they put soldiers out there and they made sure nobody was coming in or out. But the Bible says after the third day that he stood up and he's alive today and he stepped out. Aren't you glad you got a Savior that stood up? He's standing today. I'm glad. When God stood up, he came out of the tomb. I don't know if you know it, that's a big deal. How about this one? I'm about done. When God stood up, that's in Acts 7. You say, what's Acts 7? It tells you over there. Acts 7, Stephen's getting ready to die. And I mean, he's in a bad spot, a bad condition. It looks like there's no hope. He knows what they're going to do to him. They've already done it to the Savior, the same group, Caiaphas in the crowd. They're mean, they're awful. And the Bible says he looked up in verse 55 into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. I believe he stands up to receive his saints. I believe there's a day and time where all of us, our time is up here on earth. And when that happens, if you're a born again child of God, I don't believe it's just that you just get to go straight up to heaven. I believe it's more than that. I believe it's like Stephen saw it right there. And I believe there's an escort. I believe angels can take you into heaven. When Joseph Gray passed away, um, uh, Sister Heidi's first husband and Emily and his dad, he was a good man, and, when, and he was my friend. And when he passed away, just before he passed away in that hospital bed, there he was. And Sister Heidi said, he said, who are those two men at the end of the bed? She said, there weren't any men in there as far as the eye could see. She said, where? He said, right there, those two, at the end of the bed. And just moments later, he passed away. I think I know who they were. I think there were men like, like in Acts, or Luke 16. I believe they went and took God's servant and brought him out of that body and took his soul and spirit and escorted it to heaven. And you know what I believe? I believe even before he got there, he could look up and he could see something. And I believe he saw the Lord standing up, giving him a standing ovation, saying, come home, precious, in the sight of the Lord is the death of my saints. I mean, when God starts giving you an ovation, you're somebody right then. And that's what the Lord does. 
Can you imagine what takes place? Lee's mother passed away, but the Saturday before she got saved, I believe the Lord stood up and received her. You say, oh, they had her in a little box, they cremated her. That wasn't her. Are you kidding me? She was long gone. She's already out of there. And there's the Lord receiving her. When God stood up, boy, when God stands up, things happen, don't they? Stephen got the ovation of a lifetime. I always thought about that. Dorothy Langston passed away, faithful servant of the church. I bet the Lord stood up and received her. I was there when most of them passed away. I didn't see it, but they saw it. Bill Atkinson, wasn't he a good one? He went with Brother Tom. I got that staple in baptistry and all that stuff. He never got to come in our church, but he went and got that, the staple baptistry. Drove all the way down there, all the way back. He was a servant of our church. He served at our church. He did it. Anything we could ask of him, he'd do. Nice man. I believe the Lord is standing right there. Eldon Whitmire. If there's a nicer man ever lived than Eldon Whitmire, I'd love to meet him. I'd like to meet him. I can't think of one. I'm not saying there's not other nice men, but I'm saying, that was a nice man, wasn't he? But it's better than that. He told me about when he got saved. And he was a child of God, and the Lord received him. And he did a good job. I think about some of these people, like Brother Carl Kate and Buck and Bonnie Pickerel, and a whole bunch of them. And we can name them all over the building. I'm not trying to, I, so you're missing people. I know it, I'm not trying to name everybody. But boy, there's been some good ones that's been a help to this church through the years. And the Lord stood up and received them home. What a blessing that is. And I believe some of them, he said, well done. Thou good and faithful servant. That's the greatest words. That's better than any award, any raise, any money, anybody could pat you on the back. It's better than anything you could get on earth if the Lord says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The Lord stood up. But let me say one last thing. When God stood up, I believe he'll stand up when, he come, when he's coming back too. I believe one of these days the Father is going to say, that's enough. Go get them. And I believe the Lord Jesus Christ will stand up and he won't be seated next to him anymore. And he's coming back to receive those that are his up into heaven. And there's a rapture that's going to take place. And we're going to meet him in the air, the Bible says. And we're going to have a reunion up there in that air. If the Bible's right. And there's no doubt in my mind that it's right. And we're going to have a great reunion. And the Lord's coming back. And we're going to meet him in the air. And boy, it's going to be good. And then there's another time after about seven years of tribulation, he's going to get up again. And he's going to tell his church, saddle up. And the Lord's going to stand up and get on a right, white horse. And he's coming back and he's going to fight the Antichrist and all of his armies that's against Israel. If you're against Israel, you're against God. I'm just telling you right now, you're against God if you're against Israel because the Bible says so. And he's going to fight those people, 200 million men, United Nations army. And he's going to defeat them and kill every one of them. All he's got to do is open his mouth and breathe. Breathe. The blast of God we've been studying about. And it's going to be over just as fast as it started, quicker than it started. And it's going to be over. You say, what's he going to do then? He's going to go over there to the Mount of Olives. And the Bible says he's going to get off that horse. And in Zechariah 14, about verse 4, it says his feet, he saw his feet standing. He stood on the Mount of Olives and it split in two. And then he's going to go down and he's going to sit down again on the throne in, in Jerusalem. And he's going to reign for a thousand years. Say, God's got to stand up before he can sit down the next time. And he's going to come back and he's going to sit down. And when he sits down, it'll be his way or the highway. That's the way I'm wanting it too. You won't be voting anymore. Forget about electoral college. Forget about popular vote. It'll be Jesus. And he'll be in charge and everything will be done the right way every single time. Won't it be good? Let's stand together. Little message. When God stood up.